Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you being here. We've got exciting news that does not involve Garth Brooks, so we're really happy. So I'm sorry to disappoint some of you. Uh, we're announcing our first round of uh, some incredible public servants who are ready to serve the people of Minnesota. These are accomplished Minnesotans. They're experienced, proven leaders who will work tirelessly for the people of this state. We chose these dynamic leaders in a process that you'll hear something about from uh, Lieutenant Governor-elect Flanagan. Um, but we chose them mainly because they share our vision of one Minnesota. They understand the importance of ensuring that our state government betters the lives of Minnesotans no matter their race, their economic background, or their zip code. They know that one size fits all approach to government is not the way to go and that our diverse communities demand better. We chose these folks who are standing up here based on their dedication to the idea of servant leadership. Minnesotans are looking for leaders who have passion and energy grounded in a humble approach that builds coalitions to improve the lives around the state. This means breaking down the silos and working across agencies to tackle issues holistically. If a child spends a night in a car or homeless when they go to school, um, they'll struggle to learn. Yes, that's an education issue, but it's also a housing issue that could be an employment issue. Um, and we chose these leaders because they will bring common sense approach to these agencies. Minnesotans want leaders to look at approaches from different angles. They do not want rigid ideology. They want to account for facts on the ground. These leaders will bring people together from different viewpoints to find common ground. And finally, we chose these commissioners because they share our commitment to giving everyday Minnesotans a seat at the table. Minnesotans deserve leaders who value their voices, who listen, who travel to interact with them in their communities, who don't expect them to be in St. Paul. Lieutenant Governor-elect Flanagan, I often talked about giving everyone a seat at the table. The one thing we've learned over the last year and a half of the campaign and listening to people is some people don't know where the table's at. Some people don't know how to interact with their state agencies, and that's something that we need to proactively look at. So with that, I'm proud to announce a slate of commissioners today who will help ensure our communities across the state are thriving and prosperous. From fixing our roads and bridges to expanding access to affordable housing, these commissioners will ensure community prosperity across Minnesota. With that, I'm proud to announce our first uh, incoming commissioner, Jennifer Ho of the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Having served as a senior housing advisor for housing and services at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development under President Obama, Jennifer's dedicated her to career to ensuring families have a safe and affordable place to live both in Minnesota and nationwide. I personally had the privilege of working with Jennifer in that role as she took the lead role on reducing veterans' homelessness and had results that were uh, unprecedented. Uh, there is housing crisis in some of our communities. There are housing challenges in all parts of Minnesota. And with Jennifer, we'll bring extensive experience and leadership to tackling it head on. I introduce to you incoming Commissioner Jennifer Ho. Well, the first call I made this morning was to my mother in Fridley. So mom, go ahead. You can tell folks now. <laughs> I'm really excited to have this opportunity uh, and I'm thrilled to work with Governor-elect Walls uh, in DC. We did work together on veterans homelessness and, and did good things. I'm really thrilled that we're going to be able to work together uh, here at home. Um, I also look forward to working with Lieutenant Governor-elect Flanagan and my new teammates on the cabinet. Throughout the process, everyone has conveyed the values of this administration. The governor-elect spoke of his vision for one Minnesota. If we're going to be an education state, let's tackle school mobility, which means housing stability for families and children. If we're going to have universal health care, you can't be healthy if you don't have a home. For Minnesota communities to prosper, especially communities that have been most impacted by the high cost of housing, eviction, and foreclosure, then high quality housing needs to be front and center. It's how children succeed. It's how families build wealth. It's how health and peace of mind occur. And it's how communities thrive. This work gets done through partnerships across state agencies with lenders, developers, and landlords, advocates, and most importantly, with the communities and people who are most impacted. I came back home uh, to St. Paul last summer after working for two HUD secretaries in DC. It's really good to be home, and I can't wait to get to work. Thank you. Our next incoming commissioner, Margaret Anderson Kelleher, as the commissioner of Minnesota Department of Transportation. Uh, Margaret was raised in Mankato, 
Go Scarlets. Uh, <laughs> little bias there. Now living in the Twin Cities, Margaret understands very clearly the importance of addressing the diversity of transportation needs across the state. She was responsible for the passing of the last major transportation funding increase in Minnesota. She's an accomplished leader with a proven track record of bringing people together to fix our roads, our bridges, and our transportation infrastructure in order to ease congestion and improve safety. I'm so proud to announce the incoming Commissioner of Transportation, Margaret Anderson Kelleher. Well, first of all, thank you to the Governor-elect and the Lieutenant Governor. I deeply appreciate and uh, respect and I'm humbled by the ask to serve as the Commissioner of Transportation. And one of the things that really attracted me to wanting to do this is their vision of One Minnesota, their vision of a team working together, both Minnesotans rank and file, as well as the team um, that's being assembled. So I'm very excited about that and the return to public service. I called my mom as well this morning. She's 94, she's living on the farm, and she was very excited. And uh, I also want to thank my family who is here, my husband David, and our kids are here today, which is great to have them here with us. You know, I take this very personally, the issue of transportation and transit. When I was a high schooler, my elder cousin, Teresa, was killed on Highway 14 in a car accident. And it really colored how I looked at rural highway safety when I came to the legislature, making it a priority to be sure the 10 years that I spent on both the transportation policy and finance committees. It's important to people to be able to move safely in our state, whether they are in a car, a truck, if they're uh, tr crossing a train track, or in our partnership with the Metropolitan Council on Transit. It's important, too, to look forward to the transportation system of the future, and I'm excited to work with the very talented and professional staff at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. It will be an honor to work with them. We need to be thinking about this transportation system of the future, and that's where my current work comes into play, to be able to think about technologies and new ways that we will be moving people across the state into the future. I look forward to working with all of our stakeholders, our city and county leaders, legislators, corridor advocates, community leaders, of course our federal delegation, and organized labor across the state. I'm excited to work together with all of these folks as we build a transportation system for the future that has both sustainable funding and safety at its core. I want to again thank the Governor-elect and Lieutenant Governor-elect, and I'm ready to get to work. Our next uh, announcement, and again, we, uh, if you haven't seen anything yet over the last six weeks, we, we are very deliberate in, in how we structure things, and uh, I'm proud to announce uh, Nora Slawick as the chair of the Metropolitan Council. Uh, as a suburban mayor of Maplewood, Mayor Slawick understands very clearly uh, communities in the Twin Cities regions and what it takes for them to succeed. Having uh, Margaret and, uh, and Nora working together to understand that Minnesota thrives, uh, greater Minnesota thrives when the Twin Cities thrives and vice versa. She understands this approach to her role and she sees that lens of one Minnesota. And uh, during my time in Congress, uh, I relied heavily on the expertise and the partnerships with local elected officials, especially mayors. And with that, I am really, really proud to announce the incoming chair of the Metropolitan Council, Nora Slawig. Well, thank you to the governor-elect and the lieutenant governor-elect. You know, I'm really excited to be part of the Walls Flanagan team. Um, one thing I will say, I wish I could call my mom today, but my parents are up in heaven, right? Hopefully looking down on this. Uh, so I called my kids, and uh, they were very excited about this opportunity. Uh, I'm Nora Slavik, mayor of Maplewood. I've served the city of Maplewood for five years, and before that, I served portions of Ramsey and Washington County in the state legislature for seven terms. My husband, Mark, and I have four children together, and we love our wonderful parks and businesses in Minnesota. I am really honored to be appointed as a Met Council Chair. For more than 50 years, the Metropolitan Council has convened partners to accomplish ambitious goals 
unrealistic for a single community, but possible as a region. Our future depends on all of us coming together to tackle our shared challenges. As the incoming chair of the Met Council, I understand my statutory focus will be on the seven county metro. But I know that a strong region means a strong Minnesota. I'm involved in the Regional Council of Mayors and the Minnesota Mayors Associations. Just this month, we traveled to Wilmer as part of our Minnesota Mayors Initiative to talk about the common challenges we face as mayors from all across Minnesota. Access to transit goes hand in hand with ensuring our region has housing that is affordable. As the policy advisory chair of the Rush Line BRT project and a leader in the Gold Line BRT project, I know that a regional approach is key to community prosperity. We need dedicated, stable transit funding. A comprehensive transportation package will benefit regional transit and greater Minnesota transit. You know, I've been working on these issues in the East Metro for many years, and I can't wait to roll up my sleeves and get to work for one Minnesota. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. One of the things you're to talk about is the sufficiencies of governance and looking at ways across the entire enterprise to make sure that we're serving the people of Minnesota. And there's an agency that is an enabler of all these agencies in many ways, the Department of Administration. And with that, I'm really proud that our incoming commissioner, Alice Roberts Davis, for the Department of Administration. She is currently a uh, assistant commissioner over at Department of Administ Administration. Alice has experience in oversight and management in both the public and private sector. She shares, shares our commitment to ensuring our state government is equitable, inclusive, and effective for all Minnesotans. With that, I give you our incoming commissioner of the Department of Administration, Alice Roberts Davis. Thank you, Governor-elect Balls and Lieutenant Governor-elect Flanagan. I'm Alice Roberts Davis, and it is an honor to be here today. For the last three years, I've been an assistant commissioner at the Department of Administration. My primary responsibility was oversight of the state's more than $2 billion in annual procurement and its real estate and construction activities. Prior to joining the state, I led several leadership roles with Target Corporation over the course of 12 years, including real estate development, government compliance, and leading the company's $1 billion supplier diversity initiative. My public and private sector experience has afforded me the opportunity to leverage the purchasing power of large organizations and strengthen and build capacity in diverse and small businesses. I am grateful for the privilege to bring my experience to support this administration's vision of one Minnesota, where our business partners reflect our communities across the state from Worthington to Thief River Falls. The employees of admin work hard every day to ensure that state agencies have the tools they need to serve all Minnesotans. As commissioner, I will build on admin's commitment to bring the best value and service to our agency partners through our continuous improvement efforts, building and maintaining properties that best serve Minnesotans, and leading efforts to reduce the state's carbon footprint. About me, I'm from Elk Grove Village, Illinois. I've lived in Woodbury for the last 15 years, and I enjoy traveling and spending time with my family, especially my very busy teenage daughter. I'm very excited for this opportunity, and I am also ready to get to work. Thank you. There's a wide swath of expertise here from elected officials to uh, public servants to private sector expertise, local government elected officials. And, and this uh, next commissioner who gets to be called commissioner because Myron Franz currently holds that <laughs> position, um, management and budget. Um, no stranger to any of you in this room. Uh, work is foundational to everything we do. Uh, we are grateful, as we spoke a, a week or so ago on the budget forecast, um, that the fiscal responsibility and uh, good stewardship by the Dayton administration uh, has been foundational to putting Minnesota on a path to prosperity and gives us opportunities to truly build on that. At the core of that was Commissioner Franz, uh, put our state in that position, understands what it takes to, uh, to, to have a budget, but understanding that that budget is both a fiscal document and a moral document of the reflection of our values. So I am pleased uh, that uh, Commissioner Franz has chosen to continue his public service as choosing to stay in the Walls Flanagan administration as the uh, Commissioner of Management and Budget. Myron Franz.
Thank you, Governor-elect Walls and Lieutenant Governor-elect Flanagan for your confidence in me for the opp opportunity to continue to serve the people of Minnesota. During the last eight years, I've, had, I've traveled around the state and I've listened to pr the priorities of Minnesotans throughout the state of Minnesota. I've learned a great deal in my travels and the conversations. And the one constant theme that I have always heard has been to make sure that we carefully manage the state's budget so that we can continue to invest in our future. But I also have to say thank you to somebody else. It's important to thank the governor-elect and lieutenant governor-elect, but I also need to thank my wife, too. Um, <laughs> my wife, Susan Siegel, who's been so supportive of my two boys, who have been so, so supportive of my public service. And I, I know that they'll, uh, they'll keep me grounded in reality every day that I go home, I guarantee you. <laughs> but what I want to do going forward for the state of Minnesota is to continue to serve the Walls Flanagan administration by recommending sound fiscal policies that maintain budget stability and a AAA bond status so we have the resources needed to invest in education, health care, and communities around the state. Second, I want to be continue to negotiate fair labor contracts for our state workforce. Third, I want to continue our recruiting and retaining talented and a diverse workforce for the state of Minnesota. Fourth, I want to help manage and govern the, with transparency and honesty and respect on behalf of all Minnesotans. And lastly, and most importantly, I want to help to work to reduce inequality and create more opportunities for everyone to participate in our state's growth. And I'm also excited to continue to work, so I, I think I can find my office and I'll work from there. <laughs> Well, I am humbled by these uh, phenomenal uh, Minnesotans um, choosing to serve the people of Minnesota. That's who we all work for, and we're very clear about that. Uh, I'm going to bring up here in just a second uh, Lieutenant Governor-elect Flanagan to talk just a little bit about the process and, and then to answer your questions. She'll be glad to take all of them for you. <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's important to, to talk a little bit about this process, and I appreciate all of you, your patience and continuing to ask uh, how this was being done, uh, making sure that it was, it was transparent to the public but more importantly, that it was reflecting this belief that, that every single Minnesotan impacted by the decisions we make needs to have a seat at the table. And she'll talk a little bit about what that advisory board did, what these hiring agencies did, and, and the work that you maybe did not see to get to these. All of the stakeholders that work with them being asked to come in and give their opinions on what we should do, whether it's advocates for housing, whether it's the builders, whether it's the bankers in the case of housing finance, making sure all of the stakeholders were built in and feel comfortable in the team that we're assembling together. That was under the guidance and the leadership of, of our Lieutenant Governor-elect, Peggy Flanagan. Thank you, Governor-elect. Hi, everyone. Um, how great are these commissioners? Uh, I'm really excited, and I'm really proud of the work that we've been able to do uh, collectively to get here today. You may be wondering how we found these phenomenal folks, uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about our unprecedented process. The Walls-Flanagan transition team has done an extensive outreach process um, to encourage Minnesotans to engage in uh, the hiring of, of these incredible commissioners. State agency hiring directors who are led uh, by uh, Kristen Beckman uh, fanned out to meet with over 1,000 stakeholders and community groups. Traveling across the state, the directors surfaced candidates and issues um, that residents offered regarding all of these agencies. And again, because we believe so passionately that folks who are directly affected uh, by the issues we work on every day, inviting them to the table, um, we decided it was time to pull up the chairs, and that's what we did through this process. The transition advisory board member uh, members have amplified this outreach in their own communities by networking and encouraging people to engage in the hiring process. Earlier this month, we held 23 public listening sessions across Minnesota, traveling 2,100 miles, and we asked Minnesotans what values, perspectives, and leadership characteristics they hope to see in their commissioners and encouraged attendees to apply to be commissioners themselves. Minnesotans heard us loud and clear. Uh, we said there was one door, the front door, and that meant that we had nearly 500 applications for commissioner roles and nearly 1,500 Minnesotans who applied to join our administration in one way or another. 
In the interest of transparency, we are also releasing uh, the other finalists for each one of the positions we announced today. Uh, these incredible finalists give you an idea of just how strong the pool of candidates were uh, for each one of these roles. Any of the finalists who are interested uh, have been encouraged to apply for other leadership roles within the agency. We are humbled by the passion of building one Minnesota, uh, and we cannot wait to get to work. Uh, so right now, uh, we are happy to stand for any any, any questions that you might have. Obviously, government experience is key when you look at this group. Everybody has touched state, federal, local government. Can you talk a little bit more about that, that these are not people coming green, not coming from private sector, but having that government experience? Yeah, and, and they do have background in private sector. I know with, with Alice's experience at Target, um, I, I don't think that's all that uncommon where people have intersected if they've come in and in private uh, and public service. I think for us, it's critically important for us, and we're asking these commissioners to provide the flexibility with their experience that they've already had about how we're going to create something new here. And this is going to take some time as we look across enterprise-wise. So I think, again, and I ask you all, because I know the questions will come up, this is five of 23. So this question may not be quite as pointed in the next group of five that come out, but I do think we certainly value that public service. I think there's something, as I've oftentimes said, um, I tend to, when I go to the doctor, to want to go to someone who's done medicine before. And one of the things is, one of the things is if you're asking someone to have experience on leading, for example, the Department of Transportation, someone who's sat on that committee on the other side of it uh, for 10 years, like Commissioner Anderson Keller has. So. Governor Electo, then what, what was the top line quality you were looking for and what was the question that you asked each of these people when they came in? Yeah, for me, the top line quality was this commitment to servant leadership. And, and I think th that idea that we are all here to find out better ways we can serve the public, how committed are we to getting out there. And, and the top line uh, in, in a lot of cases was, is their ability to ask them, why did they want this job? And what did they believe that their agency that they were applying for could do for the people of Minnesota? What could they bring to that? And what could that agency do for the people of Minnesota? Not do to the people of Minnesota, uh, doing with them in a way that uh, that improved lives. And, and then, of course, through this process, the, the details of all that came down. But for me, I think top line starts out with this idea, this commitment to servant leadership, the commitment to a one Minnesota, and to see how these agencies can start to work together to That's deliver right. that vision. I believe every one of them mentioned greater Minnesota, rural Minnesota, or the region. Did that come from them naturally, or did you pound that into them? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think it's a great question, and it's one that we have this conversation often because one of the things you hear up here is the inclusiveness, equity, uh, diversity. Uh, in that conversation is geographic diversity, obviously. Uh, it's, it's clear that uh, for the first time in several decades, we have a greater Minnesota governor. Um, and so I think talking about that and understanding how that frame that we heard about that was starting to kind of pull at Minnesota was one that uh, we talked often that one Minnesota didn't mean everybody was homogenous. It was a shared values and a way to work together across lines of differences. So I, I think some of it probably came because they heard this echo and I think uh, some of it is that this was a group maybe was called to that siren song that it doesn't need to be this way. We don't need to be divided like this. There are commonalities, and we're all going to have to be intentional in our work of uh, bridging some of those gaps, uh, and this is one I think is, is real. Well, Governor, like, is, this, is this an extension of policies in the Dayton administration, or tell us what you think it is. Is this the third term of Mark Dayton, or what direction is this? Well, I'm not Mark Dayton, and <laughs> so no. Uh, I think it's an acknowledgement that there is a vision that we laid out during a campaign that was predicated on some of those very shared values that, that Governor Dayton had. When you invest in our people and our youngest learners, you get good outcomes. Um, when you bring sound fiscal management, it's really nice to give the next governor a surplus rather than a $6 billion deficit. Um, those are things that we're going to hold true to those principles, but I think you have a different vision of, uh, of where Minnesota goes building on those platforms. So I've made it clear, the education state, 
the state that has access and the healthiest population and communities, no matter where they're at, from Halleck to, uh, to Preston, that prosperity is being put in place. So I think you could expect when things work, um, like they have worked in many cases, uh, you'll see an extension of those. Where there are new opportunities, we expect to, to launch right into that and to build on those. That's right. Speaker Kelleher, you were here the last time when the, this gas tax conversation resulted in an actual gas tax increase. The governor-elect has campaigned on it, but there's some resistance. How, how hard is it going to be to actually get that through? <laughs> um, it's good to have the Speaker of the House. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for the question. I, you know, I think that the important thing to think about is it'll be a package of transportation yes. funding that's dedicated and sustainable. And the gas tax is an important part of the tools in the toolbox. It's still one of our bigger tools to call on, and I think it's going to take some work. It's important for Minnesotans to know that all of that funding is dedicated directly to their roads, whether it's their county roads or their state roads, and they can see the progress that we can make on bridges and roads when we have dedicated sustainable funding going forward. So it will be a challenge, but a challenge that I'm up for, and I'm excited to work with a number of the partners around the state, including legislators both sides of the aisle. On that same, along that same line, last time around you had to convince some Republicans to break with their governor. You're not going to have a problem with the governor this time. Isn't that great? <laughs> but um, how do you convince that requisite number of Republicans, particularly in the Minnesota Senate? So I think we have to think about this as a, a plan over four years to be able to build the support for, and I'm hopeful that in this first term we can do that and find that support. It's a very close margin in the state Senate, and so I think this is really about finding ways that we work with the partners in the Republican caucuses as well as the business community to be able to bring those votes forward. It's a lot like actually how we did it last time, too, and that regard. Okay. Sorry to clarify. So uh, you say it's a four-year plan. It's it's not coming in right away. You, you don't expect. Oh no. I mean, I'm talking about a four-year term. So I yeah. think it's important to think about this over those four years. It's really critical that we think about a four-year time frame of how we're doing things. I'm I'm I look forward to the governor's plan uh, that we're developing. And I think that's the again. I ask all of you, and I we want to be answers as close to the heart of what you're asking as possible. But please keep in mind, these, uh, these incoming commissioners have been on the job for three minutes now. So, uh, <laughs> but it's that, it's that uh, Lincoln quote, some of you heard me give, if, if you've got six hours to cut down a tree, he said he would spend four sharpening the ax. Um, it makes sense to think about this strategically. And I want to be clear on this. Um, I think it's my job to go out and talk to those legislators that, that I don't choose to talk about transportation funding because it's an ideological thing that I'm a litmus test for me. I'm trying to figure out what's best for Minnesota. I've said all along I'm open to talking to them. My job will be to make the case, as I think we did during an 18-month campaign from the first day on, made very clear that this is what it was. Minnesotans spoke very loudly that they wanted us to do something on transportation. They heard me, again, the advice you get from consultants is, well, don't talk about raising taxes during a campaign. That's not the best thing to do. No, it's the honest thing to do, and it's the honest thing to talk about if, when asked, what are some possible uh, routes to go. So I think having someone with the holistic approach, as Commissioner uh, Anderson Kelleher has, is talking about how do we build that consensus like they did last time that was a very impressive feat, that it appeared like the opposition to the gas tax was was there because it was an ideological purity point, that proved not to be true for many legislators. It was about what was best for their district. And I need to make the case to those legislators that it's best for their districts, whatever package we put together. And I think, again, having the commissioner there and having this conversation evolve beyond gas tax, no gas tax, into a much broader discussion on a world-class infrastructure for Minnesota for the next generation is much healthier. And I think, um, I'm not trying to draw you into this, uh, Chairwoman, but uh, this, is where the Met Coun this is where Met Council and transit comes to be a part of that. And I don't think you can have those two discussions in a vacuum. So I, I appreciate that point. And I think that's where it comes from. We're looking long term, not just our term in office, long term for the state. And I'd like to along that same point in, in terms of the role of, of 
light rail specifically. Has, is that train left the station? Is there adequate funding? Or do you see a role between you and your MnDOT commissioner and your Met Council oh. chair on, on bringing forward more expansion of LRT in, in the Twin Cities area? Well, it's too early to say exactly on the specifics, but I have made no bones about it. Transit is key to the success of this state. Light rail is, is a key piece of that. Uh, we certainly now got good news here a, a few weeks back, and that's a step forward, but this will be all of us working. And I, I think your question is, is well pointed, and I think it gets to the heart of, I hope, what you're starting to see up here, this collaboration that's going to be expressed, because again, this transit piece will start to come very quickly into housing that's accessible on those lines that will start to make the difference there. And then it'll all come back to Myron saying, well, you can't afford to do this or you can't afford to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, that's that's what we're thinking about it. And I think it's we're very specific in how it's being laid out. But Mayor Slava, you just won a second term last month. I presume you can't do both. Or you that's correct. And so I, I will be, um, when I'm sworn in as the Met Council Chair right before that or the day before, I will resign as mayor. That's correct. And, and how do you see this? Do you, do you feel like Southwest is enough down the tracks where, where it won't be kind of the vexing issue it has been for past Met Council Chairs? You know, I'm three minutes on the job, as yeah. was said, and, and what I'll say is that um, we're in a good place. That's what I think. I think we're in a really positive place with that funding coming through with the orange line. Uh, I think that a lot of the, hopefully, contention is we're moving beyond that. Yep. Governor-elect, uh, I know you have 18 more appointments to go, but you may have already matched Mark Dayton's number of women commissioners. Um, can you talk about what uh, gender and racial diversity has played in your selection and whether we will continue to see that as you do the rest of the 18? Yeah, and this this diversity, thank you for asking the question. This diversity is not about data and, and numbers of folks. It's about making sure Minnesota is better and better served by the quality of candidates who we're able to put forward. Uh, I am pleased that we were able to, uh, to be able to place uh, a diverse group in the first five. Um, that's going to be important. It's going to be an important piece of who we are, and it's foundational, as Lieutenant Governor talks about this is. But what I can tell you is, is that these candidates who are standing up here were the best candidates for the job. And they uh, making sure that we're looking at this and being deliberate that there are not barriers put up for people to enter in. And that's what uh, I think the diversity piece is. The Lieutenant Governor often talks about uh, stronger for that. So we're, we're certainly proud of that. And I would just say, you know, when we talk about being grounded in one Minnesota and uh, having an administration that looks like Minnesota, we're starting to demonstrate that. But we're not just doing diversity for diversity's sake. Uh, we are doing, uh, we want to make sure that our leaders uh, reflect folks who are going to get the best results for this state, period. So I am proud of the work that we have done. I think you will be uh, impressed by the additional folks that we bring uh, uh, before you, um, but it is not lost on us that we've got a really solid group of folks uh, standing behind us today. Okay. What steps are you taking to kind of smooth out the transit the kind of, uh, confirmation process, given that Republicans will control that? Are you bouncing names off them? Are you kind of cluing them in early? Well, we're talking, and the one thing I want to continue to, uh, it, it's incredibly encouraging to me, uh, certainly out of uh, Majority Leader Gazelka, uh, on the phone often to us, talking uh, the work that is already being uh, laid between uh, Speaker-designee Hortman himself and us, uh, not to steal anybody's thunder, but we might actually imagine this, have some real deadlines that get our job done before the 20th of May that we're all going to try and pledge to and stick to. So that, that informed communication is happening. When it comes to putting the cabinet together, I am very cognizant that these uh, incoming commissioners or commissioner designees will need to go through the confirmation process in the Senate, but I'm also uh, very cognizant that historic numbers of Minnesotans voted for this administration, and I think the default position tends to go to that. With that being said, um, there is conversations going back and forth. Uh, Leader Gazelka has, uh, in some cases, uh, mentioned specific names that would be able to go through and that we should take a look at. Uh, we are being informed by that and, and listening to that and grateful for it. And so um, they have been informed before this 
happened. Uh, they're starting to, I think, see what the parameters were, and they certainly, I, I think, folks across the state, there are no surprises here. If, if you were in the banking industry, you had a pretty good idea who was coming in and talking, and, and we were asking them to do that. If you were in the transportation construction industry, if you were an advocate for, uh, for homeless youth, you knew what was happening in this process. So it's informed. We're talking to them. Um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, this is a Walls Flanagan cabinet that reflects one Minnesota values that voters went to the polls for six weeks ago. Are you suggesting, Governor-elect, that you're considering Republicans uh, for your administration in those high levels? Yes, certainly. Um, we we certainly have said uh, everyone through the door, and I just anecdotally will tell you I had one candidate that and it felt very uh, authentic to me of saying I, I've not lived in Minnesota that long and the thought that you could actually be here and be considered for this job is really refreshing. Um, I don't know if the person would say the same thing if they don't get the job, but we'll see. <laughs> so We'll see, but I, I said I think it's that type of thing that we have folks that, that are applying. And, and again, I do want to for all of you, because I think in the spirit of transparency and trying to get this right, uh, this, is, this is a big step for a lot of people. I mean, the people that want to serve, but when you put yourself out there uh, and names are released, there's people that are nervous of how that gets perceived. Um, we're very uh, cognizant of that, but we came to the conclusion and, and people were we are very upfront with them. If you want to be considered for these positions, we will be releasing the finalists to the press. Um, they have the right to know of how that worked. And I think you'll see in some of those names that come out, you will see, you'll see Republicans. I think you'll see candidates across the board. Some that I, I think it came in front of us that, that didn't really have a strong political affiliation, but they were more public servant oriented. Mm -hmm. Are there Republicans who are finalists who are still in the pool for you? That I don't know at this time. I guess I, I don't want to speak if I'm speaking out of order on this. What I can tell you is that we have had finalists who were Republicans mm -hmm. um, at this point. You don't have a higher ed commissioner here, but you're going to have the privilege of working with a new University of Minnesota president. What do you think of Joe Gable? Well, first of all, a, a congratulations to... Uh, Incoming President Gable, we're certainly excited. Um, I uh, know what I think the rest of you know and what you've done your due diligence of informing me of reading the articles and, and the background. Uh, we certainly look forward to, uh, to working closely. That is an incredibly uh, important relationship that will happen between this administration, our commissioners, and, and the President of Minnesota. And uh, again, I am just, I'm going to name it that we have, we have a female president of the University of Minnesota, and that's a good that, that, that in itself, with the accomplishments that are there, that uh, the process seems to be attracting, and the idea that our goal is is that people want to serve in this administration, want to serve the people of Minnesota, and I think seeing a, uh, uh, an accomplished uh, provost from South Carolina decide that this was the place to go is, is encouraging. So we're really looking forward to that relationship. Governor, like, uh, as you know, there's been calls over the years for reforms in the Met Council, structural changes to the composition. Do you plan on entertaining any of those? And I'd be interested in what Mayor Slawick thinks of that as well. Yeah, no, and, and the answer on this is that this is a critically important uh, uh, critically important piece of how we bring people together to solve these. I'm also uh, very, very cognizant of, of some of the, uh, the tensions that have been over the years. And in fact, they rose all the way to the congressional level this year. Um, I don't necessarily think that's the best path for us to deal with local governance to get this right. But I, I do think, and, and again, not putting the, uh, the chair of five minutes on the spot on this, uh, I think it's pretty safe to say <coughs> that we're open to change across, not change for the sake of change, but enterprise-wide ways of accountability and metrics of measuring what we're doing. And if some of those things are composition of how we're doing things, we're certainly open to those. And I don't want to, uh, uh, to lock us in before we have the conversation, but what I can tell you and lock us into is we're, we're open to talking about this. Because again, like so many of these agencies, and especially the Met Council, one of the things we certainly all operate on is the trust in the buy-in of the public that we serve. And if that is undermined in any way or if there's not the commitment to that, we have to figure out ways to make it uh, more accessible to them. 
Well, okay. I just I really think the yeah. governor said it all. I think we're open to, to changes. We're looking that we know governance is the issue. It's been an issue since I was elected to the legislature in 1996. Uh, so we're going to look at solutions and yeah. try to figure that out. That's right. Governor, I'd love to just talk a little bit about the. You have a commissioner who's staying in his spot, another one who's uh, moving up in the agency she's going to serve. How important was that continuity, and particularly in the MMB role, where you've got this big budget task coming quickly? Yeah. Well, I think it was very important. And uh, again, we uh, certainly respect the work that was done by the Dayton administration. It's certainly kind of a unique, as I think many of you know, historically moving from a DFL governor to a DFL governor has interest in there. Um, but again, each of these folks, and, and I have to say in the case of, uh, of both the, the incoming commissioners and, and especially Commissioner Franz, that approached the process with the spirit that we wanted to, the commissioner was asked to come through the front door and submit a resume and go through the process. I, I can have to tell you that um, I'm not certain that that was, everyone felt the same way maybe about how that would have been done. But I think having that opportunity, but, but being very deliberate, I, I think especially in MMB, um, Commissioner Franz, and again, I don't, I'm not saying anything uh, out, of, out of place here, uh, universally was told that this was a very smart choice from Republicans in leadership to everyone to say you would be wise to keep Commissioner Franz in that position. So I think it's important to listen to those folks, but I also think it was important to give us the opportunity to ask people to apply. And there were incredibly talented people that applied, but you have um, a commissioner who proved, I think, under fire moving from deficits and structural threats to our bond rating back to one of the best run states and the healthiest bond ratings in the nation. Uh, that's because of the expertise of the commissioner. So it, it is important to look at that, but the process was open to all. So time for one more. Governor, what do you think of the federal judge's ruling on ACA and in light of what she was saying on the campaign trail? What promise can you give to Minnesota? Yeah, I'm always, again, this is me moving from the first branch to the second branch, now commenting on the third branch of government, <laughs> <laughs> which we're, we're apt to do. Um, these rogue rulings happen. Um, it's an incredible threat to the continuity of care for Minnesotans, uh, whether it be accessibility to care or whether it be making sure that pre-existing conditions. Uh, I want to be clear to all Minnesotans, the law is intact. While we passed the first uh, deadline for Mincher, open season for folks is still ongoing. You saw the numbers today. People are in large numbers, historic numbers, still signing up. Health care is that basic human right we talked about. I do think if I had to comment on this ruling, I think it brings into sharper focus the need of why Minnesota needs to address the issue of everything from the provider tax to the Minnesota care buy-in that we have suggested to coming back together to figure out what we're going to do. Because as I said when I was first asked by many of you almost two years ago why I was running for governor is, I gave you the answer that I believed that the federal government did not possess the ability right now to deal with some of these hardest issues. And I was convinced by the time we're standing here right now that they could exacerbate some of the problems that were most critical to Minnesotans and that being access to affordable health care. So this ruling will, will, I don't, it will not stand the test of time. Um, but I'm also one that don't, doesn't believe you, you take chances on this. This is why Minnesota needs to guide Minnesota's future. This is why Minnesota needs to take ownership for these to make sure that if something like this happens, that our citizens are, are protected to their access to high quality affordable health care. So I thank you all for joining us today. I, I can say without absolute detail, I think we'll be back in this room very shortly um, and have a new group in front of you. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.